Welcome. I guess this is the part where I take over. I haven't really done this before, so my name is Sim. Um, I'm hopefully just going to be doing this as a, as a thing for beginners, so I think what you're coming from might be a little bit advanced compared to where we're going to go, because we're going to go right to the fundamentals and basics um, of what crypto is and money is. I think sometimes, a lot of times, you know, when you're at the intermediate level or you're at the, at the pro level, you know, I know people who, who are doing Wi-Fi and, and uh, doing all this stuff. Oh, please allow you to unmute. Okay, I will let there you go. unmute. There we go. Awesome, I'm sorry. Hi, Sim. Thank you so much for joining us as well. I won't interrupt you too much, but I'm very pleased that you could join us today for the inaugural uh, World Bitcoin Forum. And um, yeah, so the format basically is 20 minutes of uh, speaking, and then we can have some Q&A. But if you want to open up to questions during the presentation, then by all means, just let us know. I, th I think questions right in the middle is always best, especially Fabulous. with my ADD. I always forget things halfway along. So uh, you know, <laughs> if you have any questions, shoot. Uh, so I'll try to make it within 20 minutes. Usually this thing goes a little longer, but um, it should be. We should be able to do it. So Amazing. let me know when you're uh, when you're able to see my screen here. Are you guys able to see that? Yep. Awesome. Perfect. So usually I give this. This warning, I'm not a tax advisor, financial advisor. Do not make decisions according to what I'm saying. If you do and lose all your money, that's, uh, that's very unfortunate and you shouldn't be just listening to some random person and making your decisions. Um, but the point of this kind of intro is to hopefully help you see some fundamentals in crypto in a way that you might not have looked at before or at least just try to build a mental image uh, of what is going on when it comes to cryptocurrency, uh, currency in general, money in general. But you know, where I come from myself, I, I started off as, uh, as in communications and culture, uh, studying mass psychology, basically, and then became an electronics engineer. Then when I came to Bitcoin and, uh, and read the white paper, I realized this is something that is, is the next step of the Internet. But also, it made me realize how this is going to affect the psychology of humans and, uh, and how a lot of the kind of nuances of that might be missed. So took that to the corporate world, started presenting it there, um, didn't really feel... Like that was fulfilling enough, so now I've brought it to people, and hopefully I can try to educate about that. I'm not going to go too deep into myself, but you know, a lot of times we think of a cryptocurrency as money, and in in many ways it does service the use case of money. But you know, a lot of people haven't even done the the, the mental exercise of just thinking about like what is money. You know, so I'll I'll put that question out there: What is money? In in one sentence, if you had to describe money, or just Give an explanation of money. Anybody want to just shoot, take a take a hit at it or swing at it? Yeah, yeah. I, I would I would say it's um, some way of sort of transferring value. It's a method of transferring value to a certain extent. Or it's I a love that. it's a yeah. I guess we can roll with that. Sure. That's perfect. You know, it, in simple terms, it's a way to transfer value. You know, for me, the way I like to look at it is. Money is, is a storage method or a transfer, a way to transfer time, effort, and energy. You know, it's, it's basically an agreed medium for us to say, I'll spend energy, I'll spend time, I'll spend effort, adding value to society. And then when society owes me that value back, I'll be able to use this, this medium that we call money to be able to get that value back. And it's, it's kind of like a storage mechanism for all three of these things. Um, and that... As a concept, money is really useful because it allows everybody to add value to society in whatever way they like. And society kind of is supposed to have an equanimous way for us to be able to, to give that value back to whoever needs it. Now, it's been stored as, you know, as shells, as gold, as paper, as cotton, as leather. Um, it's been stored digitally now for a long time. You know, so there's many different ways of storing it. It's not, the, the medium is not the, the most important thing. It's more the properties that it has that can be agreed upon in a way that uh, they service the use case of money. So looking at those properties, they kind of fall under uh, these main kind of pillars, right? Number one for money, it has to be divisible. You got to be able to divide it into different pieces. That one's pretty simple. It has to be durable because if I want to store my value somewhere, I want it to last a long time. I definitely don't want it to just disappear tomorrow. That's not a very good place to store value because it's important. You work hard for it. Uh, recognizability is an important one because everybody has to agree or a lot, large number of people have to agree to make sure that that's, some, that's a medium that we all accept 
as valuable. Therefore, we're, we're storing it there, right? Um, portability is pretty important because you can actually, you need to be able to take a lot of value into places and be able to make sure you can carry it with you. Um, but the most important for me is the fact that it has to be rare, scarcity, right? Because scarcity is what allows us to, us to make sure that the idea of money can't be, can't be corrupted, right? If, if money is, if, if whatever we're storing as money is available everywhere, then it's easy to, to, to fake it. Like, for example, you know, we don't think about the fact that what we call money today, which is technically looked at as paper money, it literally grows on trees. Like it is trees. It's literally physically trees. So like, that's not a very good storage of money. Sure, it's divisible. It is pretty durable. It's recognized. The US dollar is recognized everywhere. Um, I can transport a decent bit of it. Although if I want to transfer, transport hundreds of millions of dollars of it, that becomes problematic. I guess digital money that, that we've had traditionally in the banking system is pretty portable. But the scarcity part of it was supposed to be left with authority figures and, and governments um, and institutions that were supposed to make sure that somebody working hard for money would get a certain amount and nobody could kind of break those rules. And that's how that was the sanctity of money that was supposed to exist. Obviously, we know that whole concept has gone by the wayside and the, the gatekeepers to that system have completely bastardized that whole system. And, you know, just looking at who we left it with, we left it with banks who, were, who basically print money. Most of the money in the world is printed into existence by banks during giving, when they give loans. Right? It's not even just the central banks. It's by actual banks when they give loans. Central banks do print and control monetary policy. They create it out of thin air as well, especially the U.S. Federal Reserve. Um, large institutions and hedge funds and, and, and all of these traditional financial institutions also created financial products and many different ways of basically minting money out of thin air, like derivatives or ETNs or all these complex things which most people don't understand. So most of the money in the world was either created or stored uh, in a way that wasn't really fair. There's people working hard for money, and then there's, you know, the citizens put their trust in money, all of us, and people are spending time, effort, and energy earning money, while there's people on, in, the, in the, the traditional financial system just creating it out of thin air, right? So somebody comes along and says, okay, that's not, that's not cool. That's just not cool. How about I hook up? a bunch of computers together which are not involving any people in the process the only thing only, only place the people are involved with that is that they run the computers and they pay for the electricity and they just make sure that cooling happens and stuff but as far as the actual system itself the actual money creation and storage system we want people out of that because people create the corruption and that's where crypto came along that's where the idea of blockchain came along and bitcoin came along where you know somebody said let me just run a bunch of computers let me just program them with a, with a basic accounting book, a ledger that will keep track of how much crypto each, each one has. And I'll program it from the beginning to make sure that, there's the, that the, the creation of money is controlled. And now that is a very useful use case to society because all of a sudden, I know I can reliably store my value somewhere where it won't get corrupted, where it won't get printed into thin air, and I can reliably leave it for my descendants or for me at a later time. And I can, I can rely on the fact that value is going to be there, you know? So in, in its, in its fundamentals and its basics, blockchain is just the idea of this accounting book. It's just a bunch of computers that are hooked up together that, that keep track of what transactions go where. So that's a pretty useful use case, right? It allows you to, to not have any corruption. It gets rid of all the people that are involved. So corruption goes along with the people code is code is pretty reliable. Um, there's no central authority. Obviously, you know, there, there's people kind of managing the whole system, but there, you can really decentralize the whole thing to make sure that there's no central authority that can actually mess with the system. Anybody can access it. You know, up until now, money was only accessible, especially in those, in those investment vehicles we're talking about. It was only accessible to, to accredited investors, which are basically the wealthy. Um, or it was only accessible in its true sense to the people who even understood it. And it's so complicated that most people can't even understand it. Even the wealthy people did not understand it. So money managers would have to manage it. Whereas with crypto, it's fair. Anybody in the world with the phone can access it as long as they have internet. Um, and it's safe because nobody can just print it out of thin air. It's something that you can custody with yourself. Potentially nobody can take it from you if you've got custody in the right way. So it allows a lot of properties of money better than any other form of money we've had before. It can't be corrupted. It can't be 
Um, it can be controlled by central authorities. It doesn't involve human corruption. It, it is transportable and, and scarce and all the properties that we looked at before. But when you think about it, it's also blockchain itself is a new way of doing the internet. You know, connecting those, cause those computers together is just like a network, any network. You know, and the most valuable entities we have in the world today are computer networks. Like the most valuable search engine, Google, actually doesn't produce any pages, except for like, you know, the, the, the actual systems that it already has. It doesn't actually produce any search results. It produces search results, but it doesn't actually produce the websites that it's searching. The biggest taxi company in the world, Uber, does not have any taxis. The biggest hotel in the world doesn't have any real estate. The hotel company in the world doesn't have any real estate. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little sick right now, so like I'm hammering this one out. But, you know, the, all they are are computer networks. They're computer networks that allow for so much value to be added to society that society is willing to pay trillions of dollars for them. And they don't actually produce physical things. Same thing happened with crypto where somebody came along when we hooked up those, those, uh, those computers together and created Bitcoin and then just ran an accounting book on it. You know, Vitalik comes along and he's like, well, this is, this is a computer network just like any other computer network. Why don't you let me program it? Why don't you let me program it with apps and run it just the same way the internet runs, but instead of central authorities running internet, I, you know, we can run it on this, on this decentralized way. And that is the idea of Ethereum or all the layer ones that, that we know of. Right? It's a network of computers that let you build apps on top. So that now takes the internet to the next stage, where instead of having companies involved in it, instead of having centralized authorities running the internet, now computers can just run the internet. And these tokens are a way for us to be able to pay for those computer networks. Right? So sometimes it's easy to get things, make things really complicated. And one thing I'm noticing is in the crypto world, we like to speak crypto. We don't speak English. It sounds like English, but we speak crypto. Right, so it makes most people look kind of confused. They're like, "What do you mean the blockchain and the hash and the and the and the difficulty rates?" So they just go like, "Oh, this is some some weird thing that's like I can't participate in this." Whereas like when you explain it like this, oh, Bitcoin is just an accounting book, same the same way that the bank is an accounting book. Bitcoin is an accounting book that runs on runs on computers. Cool, that makes a lot of sense to people. You know, Ethereum is just a new way of doing the internet. It's just a it's just a network of computers that somebody you, that you can program and run apps on top. You know, okay, then now, now there's a thousand apps that are running on top and each one of those apps is a coin. Okay, so you're either buying a coin that runs the app or you're buying a coin that runs the computer network or you're buying a coin that allows you to use the Bitcoin computer network to be able to store and transact value. So just keeping it in simple terms really goes a long way. Now, I hope that makes sense. Are there any questions at this point? Do, does, does it seem like um, anything I can kind of drill down further? Uh, no, that's just amazing. I, I actually love how you've managed to sort of distill a lot of these concepts down to uh, their actual essence, because I think this is a big, uh, a big problem with uh, adoption in general. A lot of the people that I talk to who haven't really dipped their feet in yet, um, everything seems so daunting and so abstract. And so I think we, um, as the sort of community pushing this forward, need to be sensitive to try and actually communicate things in, in simpler ways, because, yeah, as you say, it's, it's the... The temptation to use all this crypto jargon is, is just uh, it's just there because you know we've spent the time learning it and we want to flex it. So I think we need to try and <laughs> try and keep that under wraps. But yeah, please, as you were. No, I, I love that, and you know, even just looking at what what's going on with with Unit and the token and and the tokenomics and the way that things are built around it, the potential is so huge. But somebody has to explain it in terms that the average person could understand. You know, and, and if we can do that in the best way, that broadens this whole horizon to people who really want to participate, but they just don't know what is actually going on. And using these analogies really help them help them kind of see that. And that's always that's always been my mission. So, you know, what is Bitcoin? I've already said it's an accounting book, but what is Bitcoin? So I'll let a professor explain that to you. Today we're going to talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is this little money. The first thing about Bitcoin is that it's decentralized, which means you don't need a bank. There will only be 21 million ever in the whole world. 
I played with him, and then I said, Tozy, make an oracle. No one knows who it is. It's a mystery. How did it all work? I'm going to show you what skills. These are all the big ones. Tilly has them. Tilly has them. They all have them. Tilly has them. This is my wallet. This is Unicorn's wallet. They all have the wallet. Dolly, there's plenty to break And so this represents the transaction. And hmm. stack it right here. Take it only one big one. Thank you, Teddy. <laughs> Thank you, Teddy. Now that's the blockchain. And we can see this. But it's all another one. Well, that's the gift of Bitcoin. Let's talk about this fun stuff. Why is it so expensive? Bitcoin is secure, anonymous, and limited. So everyone wants it. That's why the price keeps going up. This is, this is, I don't like these glasses on. I love Bitcoin, I love it, and it's scale. Okay, and who wants to do it though? That is absolutely the best explanation I've visually ever seen of somebody explaining Bitcoin. And that's oh, all it is. Know. Right? That's all it is. It's simply just transferring a coin from one wallet to another, and then the transactions get stacked in the middle on a ledger, and anybody can see them. It's not that complicated. It's just done on computers. So it seems like it's all this complicated stuff. But we're all just trying to earn the Skittles. And we're all just trying to put the Skittles somewhere where somebody can't come steal our Skittles so that later on when we want to eat Skittles, we can eat the Skittles. You know, that's, a, that's the same concept with money. Um, oops. Do I? There we go. So like she said, you know, <clears throat> to simplify things, the way I look at it is Bitcoin is like digital gold. You know, gold is limited. It has somewhat of a limited supply. Now with gold, when the demand goes up, the supply goes up too. Miners start mining more gold because the price of gold is going up. With Bitcoin, as the demand goes up, the supply doesn't go up. It's limited. 900 Bitcoin are mined today. 900 Bitcoin are going to get mined tomorrow. In four years from now, 300 or uh, 450 Bitcoin are going to get mined every day. Four years after that, 225 Bitcoin will get mined every day. So the, the, the supply is reducing at a reliable level. Demand is constantly going up, which drives the price up. Um, there's only 21 million that'll ever exist and 18.7 million exist today already. So most of them are in, are, are in existence and very few are left to be mined. So, and nobody can make more. They're easy to carry. I can carry a trillion dollars in my pocket. I can literally make it appear on the other side of the world without ever having to go through customs through an airport. If you try to move gold through to anywhere, good luck. It's gonna take you six months to move $100,000 worth of gold. You can move $100 billion of Bitcoin in one hour, no problem. Um, I can send it anywhere. I can divide it down into a million little pieces. It's accessible to everybody across the world. So all these things really make it better than gold. And gold is the best money we've ever had. It's more rare than gold. It's more reliably produced than gold. It's, it's scarcer than gold. Um, I already said that. Um, it's more transportable than gold. All the functions of money, it, it, Bitcoin serves better than gold. So, so that's why when you're looking at the value of it, I would personally put it at least at the value that society gives to gold, which is about $10 trillion, and which, where Bitcoin today is below $1 trillion. So, you know, at least a 10x growth from here seems likely. And that's not even considering all the money printing that's going on. You know, when currencies inflate, they'll have to print a ton of money, probably 10 times as much money within the next 15 years. In that process, the dollar denominated value of Bitcoin goes up, but the actual value that it stores goes up too because it's becoming more rare. Now, on, on that same thread, what is Ethereum? You know, Ethereum is just a network of computers that allows you to build apps on top. It's the same way the internet was a network of computers and allowed us to build millions of websites and apps on top. And each one of those websites and apps added so much value to society that you know, it completely revolutionized the world. Same thing's happening with Ethereum. And you know, I'm, I'm talking in simplified terms. So Ethereum, Solana, Polkadot, Cardano, all of these are just computer networks that are running. 
that allow you to be able to build apps on top. They all have different properties, but it's a simple process. When you're buying a coin on any of these networks, for any of these networks, you're buying a coin that allows you to use that computer network. And the value of that coin is the fact that you own some of the usage rights of that computer network. Um, you can automate things and the entire world is gonna be automated pretty soon, but you need these computer networks to do it. The old internet just doesn't have the capacity to do it. Now, a lot of times people ask me, you know, who owns Bitcoin? So th there's literally a bunch of public companies who already have Bitcoin on their balance sheets and many, many private companies who never have to actually disclose that they have Bitcoin. But this whole list is companies who already own it. MicroStrategy, Tesla, Square, uh, PayPal. I know PayPal is not on this list, but, you know, there, there's a ton of companies that have already woken up to the fact that, hey, if I keep my, my treasury in cash and, I'm, and I have and I'm keeping it in dollar denominated value, even if it's stock, um, if they're printing 30% of the dollars, they're taking 30% of the value of that company's treasury. You know, if they have $100 billion and they printed 30% of the money supply, that means they just lost $30 billion of actual purchasing power going forward. So they're waking up to that part and, and they're flocking to Bitcoin as a, as a store of value and, and being able to actually keep it in their treasuries and, and be able to hedge against all the inflation that's going on. See, these are just, just the public companies. These are the ETFs across the world that all own Bitcoin. There's, they're in different countries all over, the, all over the world, there's different ETFs and there's exchange traded funds. And again, this is as of June 27th, I'm sure there's, there's some updates on this that could happen. These are the countries that have it. And we know now El Salvador has already made it legal tender in the country, but there's countries and there's private companies and, and, and high net worth individuals. So, so the world is waking up, the traditional financial world is waking up to this as a value storage method because there isn't any other way to store value that's as reliable as Bitcoin. So now, hopefully that was kind of like the, the, the overview as to how to look at these things. It's not that complicated to participate in this economy, in this new digital blockchain economy. You simply have to find things that are adding value to society. So simple, simple way of doing that is you just ask, what does it do? Because, you know, all these coins have to do something for society. That's why we would be willing to pay, you know, trillions of dollars for them. Otherwise, they're, they're worthless. Uh, what does it do and how useful is it to society and where is it now? And, and using those kind of, that kind of analysis, you can really find out, you know, is this something that's worth buying or something not worth buying? For example, Bitcoin, what does it do? It allows me to store value in a reliable way, in an incorruptible way that is way better than any other, other, other uh, method of storing value. Okay, that's what it does. What's it valued at today? Less than one trillion. The, the, the nearest equivalent thing to it is gold. It's like the new gold. So how much is gold valued in society? Well, it's valued at about 10 trillion. Okay, so then it tells me that the value, not just the dollar denominated number, but the value of Bitcoin should grow about 10 times in purchasing power over, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years, but the, the growth potential is there. For Ethereum, it's like the new internet. You know, internet is a network of computers. Ethereum is a network of computers that you can program. How much is the internet valued at? hundred trillion dollars, probably even more than that. Now, am I saying Ethereum is going to get the entire hundred trillion dollars of value? No, let's just even man, let's just even imagine that it captures 10% of that. So it's, again, 10 trillion dollars of value. Where is it at today? It's at hundreds of billions of dollars. So for it to get to 10 trillion dollars of value, again, there's in, in, in insane growth potential. Now let's run the same thing on Shiba Inu, the Shiba coin. It's a meme. Okay. How much are memes worth to society? When was the last time that you paid for a meme? I don't remember paying for a meme. They're not very, they're not very expensive in society. So let me project the value of Shiba, Shiba coin. Uh, society pays $0 for memes. So the projected value of Shiba is zero. The hypothetical speculative value today is whatever it is today, but the actual use case that it brings to society in my approximation is zero. So that's how value investing works. Find what it is. Find what it's the new of, then find how much that's valued in the old world and see how much value it can add. If it's, see how good it is that it is at replacing that old system and then, and then calculate it that way. So that's one piece, but you got to have a strategy. Okay. In life, in general, everywhere, anything you do, you got to have a strategy. You got to have a plan because if you are going to participate in this market, I'll be honest, there's more than half of the cryptos that are out there are actual scams. Over 50% of them are actual scams just made to steal your money. 
The other 50% aren't scams, but many of them may not make it to where they're supposed to go to. So if you don't understand how to invest properly and you don't do these fundamental, if you, if you literally can't tell me what the coin does, you shouldn't be putting your money into it. So you got to have a strategy of understanding many different pieces in how to invest in cryptocurrency. And that's what I do. I help people develop a strategy, help them understand the fundamentals, help them understand coins in a way so that they can have a, a, a clear headed way of investing in it by understanding what they're putting money in, what they're putting their money in rather than just FOMOing their way into coins and then losing most of their, most of their net worth. So what is a strategy? You know, my a strategy is, is kind of services a few different pieces. So first of all, you don't want to invest in anything you don't understand. If you don't understand it, you don't put your money into it. Simple rule. And a strategy is a plan that allows you to, to understand all the pieces necessary for you to actually participate. Because failing to plan is planning to fail. Love that quote because, you know, an idiot with a plan can beat a genius without a plan. Simply because they have a roadmap. They know, how they know where they're headed. A strategy helps you choose cryptos and avoid scams. That's huge. That's huge. That's about 30% of the investing journey. I know you would think it's a lot more of the journey, but it's actually about 30% of the investing journey is picking the cryptos and avoiding the scams. Um, then it's, it helps you understand fundamentals. You know, so there, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that most people don't think about when investing in a market because you think, okay, well, the, the, whole, the, the most important thing is for me to go find a bunch of cryptos that are going make to make me the most amount of money and put my money into those. And that is a very amateur way of thinking about all this stuff because there's tons of different people who are talking about all these things. And if you don't have the right expertise, and I'm not saying I'm the best expertise, I'm just saying have the right expertise and have many different viewpoints that you're listening to. You know, if somebody says this is good, listen to the viewpoint that says this is bad and then build your own mental model of what that is. So, so you know, it's really important when building your strategy to make sure you have the right kind of knowledge and the right not the person who's giving you the right knowledge is going to say this. I want you to go learn about this. It isn't going to be like, I know what the best is and here's what you should do. It's I want you to go learn about it and build your own mental picture about it. What's your risk? What's your risk? You know, what level of risk are you comfortable with? Are you a person who's anxious and can't sleep if they buy the wrong coins? Then you should buy some Bitcoin. Are you a person who, who is, has a bunch of extra money and you're happy to play with it and you know, you, you're fine, you've taken a lot of risks in your life and you, you actually revel in risk? Then you can go a little bit further down the, the risk curve and maybe spread, it, spread yourself out into start slightly riskier coins. So what is your risk? What is even risk in cryptocurrency? There's 10,000 different cryptocurrencies and if I'm saying half of them are scams, then those are obviously way too risky to invest in for any, any average investor, value investor. So you have to understand the dynamics of risk. What does risk even mean in this market? You know, which is, it's different from the traditional markets. What's your strategy? And you're probably like, well, you just said all this stuff. Like, it doesn't all that constitute my strategy? No, like, there's literally too many ways to invest in cryptocurrency. You can, you can stake and play to earn games and ICOs and IDOs and investing and there's just too many different ways of investing. So you got to come up with a plan like, okay, if you want to, if you want to day trade, one of the mistakes people make is they come in and they go, oh, day trading, I can make a, apparently I can make a lot of money in day trading. And then they take 50% of their portfolio and day trade with it. And then when they lose 50% of the portfolio, they take a massive hit. So if you want to day trade, day trade with 2% of your portfolio and then 98% of it's invested. Or maybe you take 10% and put it into high risk investments, ICOs and IDOs, and you take 30% and put it into staking and you pay. But the idea is there's, there's, you have to come up with a strategy of exactly how you're going to play in the market, because that's going to then lead you to the learning step of learning how to do that and focusing on that, right? But you got to have an actual strategy. What is my plan on how to invest in the market? Where do I do it? Where do I do it? How do I do it? Like if, if you try, just try moving $100,000 from your bank account into crypto and watch how many roadblocks you hit. Your bank is going to be like, well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, can you tell us where you want to move this money? When, why do you want to move your own money somewhere? And if you send it through the wrong, wrong, wrong kind of uh, people or the wrong places, it's going to ring alarms about anti-money laundering. And then if you pick the wrong exchanges, you might have tax liabilities later on. So you have to understand on-ramps and off ramps. You have to understand how to move your money from your bank to crypto and how to move it off. Now, if you put in $100,000 and then you put a million dollars back into your bank account, you're going to have to go through a lot of hoops to prove how you didn't launder that money. You have to then select the right exchanges. You have to, it, it has to be done according to your own analysis of 
you know, where is your tax residency? What are your needs? What coins do you, are, do you want to invest in? In what capacity are you investing in? So all those pieces, if you just figure it out ahead of time, it saves you so much headache on the long term. But most people don't think about that. What we do is we just, you know, go right into it, put some, a lot of people just ask a friend, give them cash and buy a bunch of crypto. Well, as soon as you have, get to the point of taxes, that's something that becomes really problematic. And I know in the crypto world, everybody just hates the word taxes, but I swear to God, that's something that you need to think about ahead of time. Now, one of the I, biggest pieces, sorry? Tim, sorry, I just have to quickly jump in. We're almost, well, we actually are slightly over time here. Okay. Um, next up, we have a speaker, Paco. I'm not sure if you wanted to quickly wrap things up um, a little bit for everyone. I'm, I'm not sure how many slides you had left, but I really wish we actually had more time. I, I love where you're taking things at the moment. That's okay. Um, I just, I, I would literally just want to say this piece, understand the psychology of a market. If you're investing in crypto, look up a chart called the, the, the Wall Street cheat sheet or the psychology of a Bitcoin market cycle, print it out, Excel, put it on your wall, wake up to it and go to sleep to it. It is how the whole market works as far as any market. Uh, as far as investing and understanding how the process of not losing money, but also making money. But anyways, all these pieces all come together for a strategy. Uh, you know, I just love talking about this stuff. If you ever want to get in touch, get in touch and uh, love you guys. Amazing, Tim. Thank you so much for that. that. That's actually really awesome. I'd love to actually catch up with you uh, another time in person as well, actually, and pick your brain a little bit more. Absolutely. So, yeah. we'll, we'll get in touch. Thank you, guys. I appreciate awesome. your time. Thank you so much, man.